Uh, my name is Leon Fox. Um, I'm a contractor. I work for Apogee Engineering, uh, but I'm contracted to uh, the USGS, the Advanced uh, Research Computing Group. Uh, we have a small team um, that do high-performance computing. We have a small supercomputer in uh, Denver, Colorado, so I get to play on that every day. Um, and this is some work that uh, I've been doing with um, my co-author, Burke Minsley. He's from the Geology, Geophysics, Geochemistry Science Center. Uh, he's also in Denver. Uh, and this is really uh, his work uh, that he's sort of brought me on to, to help him out with. So some of the motivation. Burke uh, came to this group. Uh, he's, you know, he's done a lot of fantastic work. He's written MATLAB code, a lot of it. Uh, it's sort of procedural. You know, it's all, all over some functions. Uh, and the idea was, I don't want it in MATLAB anymore, I want it in Python. Uh, I also want it parallelized and I want it scalable. Um, so that's where I came in. Uh, he wanted object-oriented code. Uh, he doesn't want to pay license fees anymore. Um, again, parallelized and scalable. Uh, and then one of the biggest bottlenecks with this kind of application, which I'll talk about in a minute, is um, file I.O. Okay, it's one of the biggest causes of bottlenecks in HPC uh, algorithms. Uh, so how do we handle that? How do we do that quickly uh, and efficiently? Uh, and there's an image of the small supercomputer that we have uh, on campus. So just an overview, because I'm not quite sure what everybody's backgrounds are. Uh, a little bit about Electromag, um, a little bit about geophysical inversion. Um, I'll talk about the building blocks of this package itself uh, on a bare bones level. Um, talk about the inversion algorithm really quick, and then the crux of the matter is uh, how this algorithm works in parallel. So Electromag, uh, this image on the right, there is, you might not be able to see the helicopter at the back because it's so small, but there's a helicopter in there. Uh, and it's towing behind it uh, two loops, two giant loops of wire. Uh, one is a transmitter, one is a receiver. You turn on a current in the transmitter loop, it generates an electromagnetic field. It excites uh, physical properties in the ground, in this case electrical conductivity, which in turn generate their own signal, uh, and that signal induces a voltage in a receiver loop, um, which we can measure. And so we take this helicopter or this uh, aircraft, sometimes you've got an aircraft that you've wrapped a massive loop of wire around the wing, the wingtips, the nose, the tail, it's crazy, uh, and we fly it over tens to hundreds of square kilometers across the earth. Um, a typical size of one of these data sets is maybe tens of thousands to tens of millions of data points. It gets pretty big uh, really quickly. Um, and some of the major applications of this kind of data in geophysics are uh, groundwater modeling, uh, permafrost, that's a real big one right now, Alaska, Canada. Uh, you can't build bridges if there's no ground there anymore. Um, contamination plumes, that's good for detecting that kind of thing. And uh, especially the USGS, the critical mineral resources, uh, that's uh, one area of, of interest. So then what is geophysical modeling? Um, so let's say we have an idea about what our Earth looks like. We, we know the physical structure. We use a physics, we might have integral equations, we might have partial differential equations that we're solving, uh, and we can take that known model and we can generate some synthetic data. Uh, but that's not typically what we do uh, when we're out in the field, right? We don't know what's below the ground. Uh, we take geophysical measurements, uh, in an aircraft in this case, or a helicopter, and we've got uncertainty associated with those measurements. And what we want at the end of the day is to obtain an estimate of what the subsurface looks like. Okay, and so to do that, we involve the physics. We need to use that four modeler. Uh, we use maths, we use optimization. Depending on the type of inversion, we might use regularization. Uh, and in a Bayesian setting, we might do this over and over and over again with multiple trials, uh, hundreds of thousands to millions. Um, and what that provides us with is, A, the best, uh, most likely estimate of what the subsurface might look like, but also the uncertainty that's associated with all of those model parameters that we just tried to recover. Um, so this leads to GeoBiPi, okay? And uh, that's my sort of half attempt at trying to do the phonetics. Um, so it's, it's Bayesian inversion uh, for, in this case, geophysical data. Uh, and we're using a stochastic trans-dimensional MCMC approach. So the size of the dimension as the, as the problem progresses can change. Uh, it's object-oriented. It's uh, massively parallel using MPI and then the Python wrapper MPI for pi. Uh, and then we use uh, HDF5 and H5Pi with their parallel capabilities to, um, to do file writing uh, very quickly. So I just want to get a show of hands of who's done MPI. 
Okay, good. Who's done HDF5? Who's done HDF5 in parallel? Ooh, okay, okay. Oh, cool, cool. Thanks for being here. Um, so, I'm just kidding. So, uh, so the software is free, it's open source, um, and it's available on GitHub. There's a, it's been preliminarily released, um, which is really nice to, to obtain. Uh, so it's at github.com slash usgs slash geobipy. Um, tell me what you think, send me issues. It's gonna be great to get some collaboration on this because I'm a lone wolf right now. Um, it's fully documented, so automatic uh, developer doc generation using Sphinx. I've used the NumPy style, so it should be familiar to you. Um, those are also stood up on uh, USGS github.io slash geobipy. Um, and then one of the crux of documentation, right, is that users come in and they don't necessarily want to read the developer docs. So every single class in geobipy has a notebook associated with, you, with it. It tells you how to instantiate, so very basic, it tells you how to instantiate the class how to interact one class with another, right? how to make it perturbable, how to evaluate that given some statistical distribution. Um, so uh, that's, that was really a focus of, of the docs for me. Um, so the building blocks. So let's just get down into the nitty gritty. The base building block or the base class is called the stat array. Um, it's kind of similar to uh, an X array uh, because it extends NumPy directly so we can maintain that fast C backend. Um, and basically you just attach a name and units to it so that the code knows what it is, what the units are um, for plotting purposes and saving data, the metadata in the, data, in the results files, um, et cetera. Uh, and it's pretty easy, so we instantiate it. We just say, you know, x equals stat array, and I've just given it one number, it's a value of five, and I've given it a name and some units, and when I do a histogram of that, that histogram knows what it is, and it can just quickly plot that. Uh, but then the crux is we're doing a Bayesian uh, framework, right? So we need to attach a prior distribution to our parameters or variables that we're trying to solve for. And we also need to attach a proposal distribution. So if we have a prior, we can evaluate the v uh, values of the stat array against that prior. And if we have a proposal, we can propose new values of the stat array given, given the attached proposal distribution. Uh, and that's pretty easy, right? It's x dot set prior, x dot set proposal. You give it some, some string, normal or uniform. In this case, I attached a normal prior with a mean of four and a variance of one. And I attached a uniform uh, proposal with a min of two and a max of six, right? And you can see that in here. And if I run this over and over again, you'll see that it will randomly generate values of the stat array and it will evaluate that new value against the prior, right? And it's using the proposal to generate that new value. So we take this stat array and we use it to build other classes within GeoBiPy, because now we have to start thinking about how we represent the Earth, the geophysical data, the data sets, whether it's a 3D point cloud and things like that. So uh, we take a 1D model, uh, we use it to discretize a 1D layered Earth. It might contain sort of the number of layers, uh, the thickness of each layer, the interface of each layer depth. Um, um, the, yeah, the interface of that, uh, the depth of that interface, and then the actual value that you're interested in of each layer. And again, it's pretty easy. So we uh, to instantiate. So we've got some parameter. That's a stat array. Uh, I've said that the thicknesses are all just it's, every single layer is 10 meters thick, uh, and I create a model 1D, 10 layers. There's the parameters. There's the thickness, and then I just p-color it, and there we are. And I say grid equals true. And that creates our um, little image for a schematic. But the crux, so the crux of the MCMC algorithm is that everything that you have in your framework needs to be perturbed. You need to be able to uh, advance along the chain in order to uh, determine whether your perturbed values are uh, acceptable or not. Um, and so in this case, one of the key steps in the terms of a 1D layered Earth model is we assign probabilities. And those probabilities to pertain to whether we create a layer or an interface, delete an interface, change the depth of an interface, or do nothing. Um, and then once we've changed the structure of the model, we can update the values. In this case, we're using a stochastic Newton method, so it's using Hessian and gradient information of the negative log posterior to, um, to update those conductivity values uh, cleverly. Uh, and that's easy. We make the model perturbable. Here are the four... Uh, percentages or fractions that pertain to the um, probabilities of birth, death, change, or no change. Uh, and then there's some extra um, parameters off the screen um, to, to make this uh, usable. 
Uh, and then we simply say mod.perturb, and that's generated a new model that, that has perturbed values. And so if I do this over and over again, uh, you can see that, let's see what happened here. Uh, this interface was deleted, right? Do it again. Uh, this interface was deleted, right? So you can see how, how it's random. Um, so we've got the model. Uh, the next step is to take a representation of the actual geophysical data. Uh, in this case, we've got an electromagnetic data point, and there's two types of acquisition. One's frequency domain and one's time domain. Um, and that's pretty simple as well. We instantiate a time domain data class. Uh, typically, the data arrives to us as an ASCII file or you know, just a column tabular type of data. Uh, so we read that in. Uh, and then there's also a system file that describes the frequencies that were used to acquire that data, what the coil separation was, uh, all of these physical parameters that we need uh, to, to use in the form modeler. Uh, so we read in that data set, and then I simply get the first data point from that data set. And that is now a class in GeoBiPy that represents time domain or frequency domain data. And they know, uh, so there's a, there's a plot of that. So in this case, there's two systems, there's two moments of acquisition uh, inside this time domain uh, system. And so if we've got a 1D model, we can pass that 1D model to some functions of the data point, and it knows how to generate its synthetic data, and it also knows how to compute its sensitivity to, the, to that synthetic data. So in this case, I say p, p2 dot f the, the data point dot forward, and I pass through that same 1D model that you just saw. Uh, and I say that J2 is the sensitivity, and I pass through that same model. Uh, and this is what it looks like. The yellow line are the synthetic data generated from that model. And um, this is essentially the um, sensitivity matrix that you get when uh, you differentiate the data with respect to conductivity, uh, which we need during the inversion. So to do a single data point, it's a really simple algorithm. Um, while we're not done, perturb the model, so change the number of layers, change the conductivities of those layers, change maybe the elevation that the helicopter was at when we acquired that data point, change our estimates for the additive and relative errors uh, within that data, evaluate all those perturbed values, and then accept or reject them. And if we reject them, just go back to what we originally had and perturb it again. If we accept it, keep it, and perturb it. So I'm going to do a demo, fingers crossed. Um, so it's pretty, um, it's pretty simple. I've created entry points into uh, the GeoBiPy package. Hopefully you can see that. Um, so in this case, I'm just going to run a serial version. There's also GeoBiPy parallel. So it's GeoBiPy serial. I give it a user, a user input file, which is actually a Python script. So it's not like a text file that, that's typically seen with a Fortran or a C code. Uh, and then I give it some output directory. And so what I'm going to do is I'm, I've set it up to run 100,000 iterations. I'm going to output the results. So I'm going to output this interactive image uh, every 500 iterations. OK, so it actually burned in. So if, if you're familiar with Bayesian, there's always a burn in period. Uh, so this is where it burned in. And we didn't actually save uh, any of those results. And then as soon as it burns in, uh, we start to generate the posteriors for each of the variables that we're solving for. In this case, We've turned off elevation, which is why there's only one, uh, one bar. Um, this is the, uh, the posterior for the number of layers in that 1D uh, layered Earth model. And everything in yellow is the best or the most likely model so far. Um, and then this might be the histogram for the relative error, uh, the additive error. And this is a hit map. So this is depth on the y-axis and um, resistivity or the inverse of conductivity on the x-axis. And so it's telling you uh, how often an area of the subsurface is being hit by what conductivity. And I'm sorry about the uh, font size. It's uh, a little strange. So the reason why um, you want this interactive demo style is because um, this is a parallel code, right? And you don't want to just submit a, a data set that's going to take you know, 70 hours to run without first investigating what your values for your priors are, right? So the reason why we have this is so that you can take a few sample data points from the entire data set, um, you know, really fine tune your parameters on one data point first, uh, apply it to the rest, um, and make sure that you're actually uh, getting something that looks feasible. 
And so I mentioned that this is parallel. So, and I mentioned that data sets come with uh, tens of thousands to tens of millions of data points. Uh, and so because each data point, when we invert that, it's independent to the one that's next to it, the results of one don't influence the results of another, we have an embarrassingly parallel problem, um, which makes it very easy to parallelize. So it actually made my job quite easy. I'm on camera. Oops. Um, it's extremely low memory, so each core only needs a maximum of 512 megabytes, um, but we're generating terabytes of results in terms of the statistics at the end. Um, and there's minimal communication. We do it in a master worker fashion, so we simply create a random list of all of the data points in the data set. The master sends out an integer to each worker. Each worker inverts its set of data writes its results to a HDF5 file, and then it asks the master for its next data point to, to invert. Uh, so it's really quick. Um, so writing the results. Um, this is where uh, a lot of bottlenecks come in for uh, embarrassingly parallel problems, especially of this kind where uh, what we could have done was um, taken each data point, inverted it on a separate core, and each separate core writes its own ASCII text file um, so if I've got 10 million data points, that means I've just written 10 million files. Um, if you do this on a HPC machine, you're going to get a nasty email from sysadmin saying, please don't do this ever again. Okay? Uh, it's the biggest bottleneck for any parallel code. Um, it's also terrible for post-processing. If you're trying to make maps and 3D models of all of these results afterwards, you have to read in 10 million files just to do that. It's going to take forever. Uh, and then finally, ASCII is, is pretty slow, so we, we want to use binary files. So that's where HDF5 comes in. Okay, it's a, it's a binary file, binary file format. It's got a balanced binary tree in the header, so it's really quick at accessing uh, different chunks of data. If you had a massive data file written in ASCII, you would have to read the entire thing in, or at least skip lines just to access the piece of information that you want. No longer have to do that with HDF5. What's really nice is you can open a file with parallel write mode. So if I have 2,000 cores, uh, all running their own process, and everybody wants to write to that one file at the same time, you can do that. What we do then is we add a parallel file system for the hardware so that we're not just asking 2,000 cores to all write through a single uh, gateway, essentially. So things like Lustre, GPFS, uh, they have multiple heads that they can use uh, to write things to the file in parallel. Uh, one of the caveats with using HDF5 in parallel mode is you, you really need to know uh, the size of your file uh, that you're going to need. So you need to know that up front. Um, what you typically, typically do is you open the file at the beginning in parallel write mode. You create all the space within the file. So for example, uh, this column right here might be each block represents um, a separate data points elevation histogram. Uh, and each core, as it finishes its inversion, accesses that file and writes its pieces to the appropriate places. So it writes its elevation histogram to this block, et cetera, for, for maybe there's a 2D hit map. Okay, so everybody's doing this at the same time. Uh, as long as nobody's trying to write to the same data location, you're good. So we have all these results. That's cool. And then we've got to um, plot them. So. Um, we have some classes inside GeoBiPy, so line results uh, is one of them. So we instantiate it with the name of the file. Uh, we give it a system path to tell it where, uh, where that acquisition file for the system is. Uh, and then we tell it which axis to plot it against, if it's northern, easting, or just along uh, the distance along the line. Um, Um, and so we can create, so this is generated from a single HDF5 file, um, and it's a full line of, of data that was acquired. Uh, I think this one's in Yellowstone. And um, what you can see is uh, we've got depth here, or elevation, uh, on the y-axis. We've got northing on the x-axis. Um, each one of these columns is a separate data point that was inverted. And on top, we have the mean conductivity with depth for each inversion. And on the bottom, we have the most likely conductivity with depth for each inversion. And you can see that in yellow, we've got areas of high resistivity. And in blue, we've got areas of low resistivity or higher conductivity. Okay, so this is electrical conductivity. Uh, and what you see is that there's this undulating 
depth uh, bottom to this model, that's because we've scaled the opacity to the confidence that we have in our recovered uh, parameters, right? Because you don't want to show, you don't typically want to show data that you're not very confident in. Um, just some other plotting uh, functions. Uh, in this case, we've got the uh, number of layers in the best model for each data point. Um, and then using the histogram of the interfaces with depth, um, we can pull out likely interfaces under the ground. So that's a, that's a line of data. So what about if we've collected a huge data set? Um, we can do that. We can create maps. We can export it to VTK and spin it around in 3D. Uh, same thing, we've got some, oops, we've got some data set result. We've got a data set results um, object. We give it a directory containing all of those HDF5 files we just generated for that one uh, data set. And we can create maps uh, of, of depth slices. So I think this is at uh, 20 meters and 30 meters. You can see how those change. Uh, and then we can export a VTK file uh, and do analysis there. So efficiency, this was like one of the biggest things that we had to deal with uh, with this code. Um, it's all, it's got to be NumPy, right? There can't be anything Pythonic because um, the speed up is phenomenal. Uh, we have a time domain EM4 model that's written in C, C++ by Ross Brody, is at Geoscience Australia. Um, there's a frequency domain 4 model that originally came to me in Pyth Pythonic Python. Uh, so I rewrote it in NumPy, got 10 times speed up right there. Uh, and then I rewrote it in Fortran, because I'm actually a Fortran guy. Um, <laughs> so I rewrote it in Fortran, and so it went down from 7 milliseconds per model to 4 milliseconds per model, which might not seem like a lot, but when you've got 670 data points, and you're doing 100,000 iterations per data point, it takes 62 hours down to 36 hours if you're using 2,000 cores. Uh, and we also don't have the extra memory overhead that you get through broadcasting through NumPy. So just some timing, uh, timing stats. If we're using 2016 cores on Yeti, the smallest example that we had was 45,000 data. Uh, average time per data point is 24 minutes. Total time, 12 hours. If we were to run that in serial, it's 50, uh, 1,500 times faster than that. Uh, and in the biggest case that we've run so far, 670,000 data, 11 minutes per model. It took 62 hours, uh, which is 14 years if we ran it in serial, and that was 1,981 times faster on 2016 cores. You never expect it to get um, exactly the same number of speed up because of overhead. So that's it. So to conclude, um, we've got a highly efficient Bayesian inversion for geophysical data. Um, we can fully utilize any of the partitions on our supercomputer. I'd be really interested to run it on something much bigger. Um, and it's really a framework for other geophysical data. We're already looking at other data sets, ground-based time domain. Right now we're using a dipolar approximation for airborne, so we can't take that to the ground. Uh, we have magnetotelluric data in the works, for nuclear magnetic resonance, uh, seismic data, induced polarization, so the world's our oyster, oyster at this point. Um, and then we also want to introduce some advanced functionality, uh, parallel tempering. Uh, we can use intersounding communication to try and get some lateral constraints uh, into the inversion. And then we also want to incorporate hard um, constraints from boreholes. Uh, so just to acknowledge the Advanced Research Computing Group, USGS uh, Frontier Geophysical Methods and Applications Project, and also Ross Brody for his time domain uh, for Muddler. Thank you. Are there any questions? How much of this would you say is applicable outside of geology? Yes, that's, that's a good question. Um, right now, uh, if, I mean, if, if your problem fits, then you can probably use it. But um, it's not as generic as I would, have, as I would hope it to be. Uh, we had a goal originally, and that was to reproduce uh, the results that Burke was already getting, uh, and then to take that and make it, and make it parallel and scalable. Um, and then in doing so, I kind of tailored it specifically to this problem. And then as we encounter uh, new applications, things that people want to try and do with this, then we can uh, modify it and make it a little bit more general uh, for those applications. 
Questions? Oh. Thanks for the talk, it's great. Um, and maybe this is a general, more general than the specific domain, but uh, you didn't get a chance to talk about testing uh, in terms of integration or unit testing. Yep. And I think particularly given the hardware you're working on, uh, I'm interested in how you deal with that. And secondly, I agree that people, the devs tend to like to have notebooks as documentation rather than writing doc strings. How do you <coughs> test the notebooks in, in or, or do you test the notebooks as part of the, the, the testing framework? Sure. Um, yeah, so a test-driven development was um, not my background. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, my background was Fortran. Uh, I, it was PhD Fortran, so I didn't, I didn't really, you know, do the, too much of that. Um, the testing at this point is uh, making sure, you, you know pretty quickly with this whether the final results are, are off. Um, things just spiral out of control really quickly. We're lucky in the fact that it is so embarrassingly parallel that I don't really need to test it in parallel. I can test it in serial and expect the same kinds of results to happen on the other cores. Um, one of the biggest things I think was the uh, random number generator. Um, because if you start to, if for those that uh, do random numbers, if you're going to do them in parallel, it's a whole different kettle of fish. Um, you have to be careful with what your initial seed is. Ideally, you want to use the same seed and you want to jump the state of the generator, but that's not always possible, especially with Mersenne twister algorithms. Um, so those are some of the things that we have addressed during the development of this. And the new terminology is pleasantly parallel. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, quick question. Since since this is a, an embarrassingly parallel problem, uh, did you did you give any thought to trying to ditch MPI altogether uh, and just have a parallel file system so that you could make use of other clusters that are. Um, you, you know, made more for serial nodes since the problems run what 11 to 24 minutes. It said per per machine, so that should be, you know, well suited for something of, uh, a cluster of that size. For like a what kind? Of, yeah, just like like a cluster that doesn't necessarily run MPI. In other words, right. So still then. Maintain MPI. Sure. Uh, the reason why we went with MPI was purely for the file I/O and being able to write, read and write in parallel. So you can, you can take this algorithm and you can actually run it on a, a system that's not MPI enabled. It will still run in more of a high throughput computing style of paradigm and you'll still be able to generate a file per data point if you wanted to. Um, so does that answer your question? Okay. So just a bureaucratic question. So you single-handedly got Sphinx up and running uh, I imagine, did you get some form of CI up and running? No. Um, not yet? No, not but yet. But you got it on GitHub working with USGS. How did you find the process within USGS and were they particularly supportive of having the data being open sourced? Yes, is the short answer. Uh, it, was, I, it was a little work just to figure out what the process was um, officially. Uh, because it's still a new area, especially on software. Uh, data release is very well established. Um, is, is very well established, but the, the, date, the software side is, is lacking. Um, but no, everybody was, everybody was great. Everybody was really gung-ho for, for it to happen, and that's why it's preliminary released right now. So it hasn't gone through a full release, but we're allowed to do a preliminary release with a disclaimer stating that it is preliminary. So... Um, be careful. Perfect. Did they, is it uh, BSD or what license did they <laughs> push on you? Uh, so the guidelines right now are actually CC0. Oh. <laughs> Groans, no. Um, but then there's a, the time domain 4 modeler is GPL version 2, so we have to dual release it right now under, right. under those. <laughs> and on that note, can we thank the speaker again? <laughs>